Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And I haven't spoken or presented my work, actually, in Berlin or Germany for the last five years. So thank you very much, Nana, for this invitation. Um, just a quick disclaimer that um, I wish not to be visible on documented material. So if you would like to take pictures of the slideshow, please feel free to, but just make sure that I'm not in the frame. Um, kurze Anmerkung auf Deutsch, dass ich bitte nicht auf Bildmaterial erscheinen möchte. Um, also ihr könnt gerne Fotos von der Leinwand machen, aber bitte mich außerhalb des Bildrahmens halten. Um, this lecture uh, consists of three parts and I'm going to give you a brief introduction into my work and then I will speak about uh, eight selected examples of my works kind of focusing on different aspects that I worked out for this particular context. Performativity and non-performativity. Anonymity, which is part of the title. Colonial relations and gender perception. And then the last part will be just a quick note about my trajectory, my Werdegang, um, growing up in Germany and now living in the United States. While I give a short introduction to my work, you will see a few works just circulating in the background as images. I identify as a sculptor while also working on paper and with video. The materials that I use for my sculptures are ceramics and metal. Ceramics is what I use to create casts of my own body and metal is used as a structure and a support that holds the ceramic pieces in place. The sculptures that I make appear as functional objects, which I invent a use for. And I refer to them as tools or apparatuses and sometimes entire scenes. The sculptures are not meant to be physically used, neither are they meant to be activated by performances. Instead, I like it when viewers approach my work like a crime scene trying to piece together traces of information. Um, and that way, viewers can import their own projections and experiences into the work, or more specifically speaking, viewers can import their own projections and experiences into these hollow spaces, negative spaces, in German I would refer to them as Hohlräume, created by partial body casts. A space where a body could fit in, but the actual body is not portrayed. The context of this particular symposium is a new impulse for me to think about my work. The title, The Anonymous Body, popped up in my mind quite intuitively when I was invited to partake. The title of this symposium, Performance of No Thingness or Nothingness, depending on how it is pronounced, has a negation within it that I can relate to with my work. In my work, there is a negation to fill in the gaps, a negation to end the sentence, and a negation to be present. The imagined body in my sculptures is absent, and the viewer might encounter a lack of information, a lack of information about identity, and a lack of information about the imagined body. In my work, I exclude elements that determine a person's documented identity, so to speak, such as eyes, age, or complexion, haut ton. The elements that hint towards gender are intentionally created ambivalently, and at the same time, there is a tension of biological determinism, biologische determinierung, found in titles such as penetrator. My work often originates from the title. 
The titles address a doer and done to dynamic that then is underlined by mechanical elements such as buckles, wing nuts, and straps, schnallen, flügelschrauben, and riemen. The titles imply a function, a person, a role, all at once. I use the body and mechanics as a metaphor for power dynamics that can exist physically and psychologically within intimate personal relationships and power dynamics that can exist on a socio-political level. Since I'm not including dimensions in the caption sheets in this presentation, please feel free to interrupt me if what you're looking at does not make sense in terms of scale. I will um, walk you through the materials and will help you identify what you're looking at, but if something is very unclear, please feel free to interrupt me. So now we're entering the second part of this lecture and I will walk you through the selected examples of works. And the first one we're going to start with is Muter from 2017. And um, it is partially salt glazed ceramics with a ceramic strap um, with a metallic glaze resting on a metal surface. And um, you're looking at a cast of the eye-nose area, kind of mask-like. Um, and the, peer, the piece appears as a single object, but it also is part of a larger sculpture titled Operator One, in parentheses with blinder, muter, penetrator, aborter, also from 2017. I refer to this piece as an analogy to a relationship. The two sets of handles represent the collaborative aspect of it, and the four elements on the trolley surface are elements that appear within that relationship. The four elements carry the titles blinder, muter, penetrator, aborter, in here in the order from left to right. After spending time in Bahia, Brazil last November, I came across an image of Escrava Anastasia. It is a very present image as a symbolic figure, and I realized that I made the piece muter that I showed you earlier, having mechanisms of personal and intimate relationships in mind. Escrava Anastasia is a saint slave myth, and this drawing is dated with 1838 to 42. The silencing mask was a common object used to suppress speech and sound of enslaved people. Here we have an example of one identified person, even though possibly a myth, who becomes a symbol for numerous, endless, unnamed, and anonymous individuals who share this experience of being muted and silenced. After coming across Anastasia's image, I became interested in those mechanisms of oppression that exist within intimate, personal, social, and colonial relations. Let call, let's call it a, a ranged metaphor, a metaphor for relations that can be anything from intimate to political. With this ranged metaphor in mind, I revisited works that I had already made, and I found new meanings in a few pieces that I would like to discuss in the following. The next piece is titled Extruder, also from 2017. And we are looking at partially glazed ceramics, a metal pipe system, concrete tiles, and a ceramics auger. The elements in this, what I refer to as scene, are two partial body casts, a mask with no eyes and an abdominal unterleibs cast with one hole. A pipe system goes through the open mouth of the face cast 
and leads around the imaginary body and ends with a spilled puddle underneath the end of the pipe, close to the abdominal cast. A large hand drill in agriculture called an auger used to penetrate the ground is lying on the concrete tiles as a potential penetrator and has traces of blue lacquer, the same lacquer that the puddle consists of and that resembles the inside glaze of the casts. The anonymous body is kneeling and for its position I was inspired by Kara Walker's a subtlety that she created in 2015 as a commission by Creative Time to be on view at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn. When I first saw the around 10 and a half meter tall sculpture, I was struck by the way her sexual organs are directly exposed and at immediate service, easily approachable and the position reminded me of physical exploitation. I imported this sentiment into the composition of the installation extruder and emphasized the exploitative aspect by the intentional spill of the liquid. The narrative of the sculpture on a less literal bodily level can be read as a colonial intervention. There is a forceful intrusion and transgression of boundaries, skin, marked by the ruptured holds of the casts. The intrusion is executed with technical advancement, on one hand, with a drill of a phallic diameter and oversized length, and on the other hand, with an industrial pipe construction that conveniently places the end of the pipe close to where the anonymous active agent, a potential colonizer, could be positioned in order to perform the extrusion and capture the resource represented by the bodily fluid. I'm realizing that I should um, describe this mechanical um, word extrusion for those who aren't familiar is the hollowing out of a volume. It's to squeeze substance out of a volume. Auspressen would be the closest in German. To bring this idea of exploitation even further, one viewer even thought of the penetration of Mother Earth and the exploitation of the inner resources. The next piece I would like to discuss is titled Protector 2 from 2016. As a material note, we're looking at all ceramics, including the straps, they're unglazed ceramics. And the piece is probably the one that is mostly identifiable to viewers as a functional object in reference to a chastity belt, a Keuschheitsgürtel, with a flap for a potential erection. And what interests me in this piece is the ambivalence of what is being protected, the inside or the outside. And the piece has a shielding, abschirmende function, as well as a confining or eingrenzende function. Very much in line with the proximity to identifiable functional objects, I would like to discuss the piece Exoticizer, comma, worn out, in parentheses, Josephine Baker's belt from 2017. For those who aren't familiar, Josephine Baker was a performer, dancer, singer, political activist, French resistance fighter, and mother of 12 adopted children of all different races referred to as the Rainbow Tribe. She had a very complex identity. However, 
She is iconically most known for the banana skirt costume. Again, here the aspect of anonymity comes to mind as her actual identity is radically removed from and reduced to her image icon, almost as if it doesn't matter who she actually is or was as long as she fits the role given to her. Baker was born in 1906 and raised in the south of the United States in St. Louis, Missouri, and migrated to Paris, France in 1925 at the age of 19, hoping to pursue a serious career in dance that was inaccessible to her as a black woman in the United States. According to several biographies on Baker, the moment she was mildly, so to speak, suggested, or rather made to wear nothing but a banana skirt on stage was deeply insulting to her. And it was quite a symbolic moment for the discrepancy between her hope and the reality of establishing a career in Europe at that time. I remember approaching the piece um, the belt uh, in the perspective of the person designing such an object and really getting into the details and figuring out the distance between the little sleeves that would hold the banana stems, leaving enough gaps to um, peek through the private area. What interested me here is the difference between the wearer and the person who puts it on and what that means psychologically for those who feel exoticized. On a metaphorical level, what to do with the suggested costume. The images you see here are the second version of the piece with um, the modification comma worn out in the title as a statement that this object has been retired of its use, emphasized by um, elements of rips and tears, such as the broken buckle. And the last sculptural piece in this presentation that I would like to discuss with you is titled Tuner from 2016. This piece relates to the Adam's apple and suggests an adjustment of its position represented by the wingnut, the Flügelschraube. I made the piece with the Adam's apple in mind as a gendered symbol and a symbol of masculinity and voice quality. After recently revisiting the piece under the lens of a wider scope of meanings, the ranged metaphor as I called it earlier, I found further meaning in it and thought about music instruments and the act of tuning. I thought of the controlling aspect of tuning and how it controls the voice of an object that is made to speak. I also thought of the mechanism of having to filter and adjust what we want to say in order to make it digestible. I would now like to return to the image of Escrava Anastasia. By the way, um, there are many aspects to the storytelling of Anastasia, um, such as her supposed healing power, her endurance, the fact that it was told that she had blue eyes that I think are worth a lecture of its own that I'm not going to get into today. Another element in this drawing and another commonly used element of oppression of enslaved people was the punishment collar. In this image, the collar is a heavy, solid piece of metal that has the purpose of burdening the enslaved subject. I thought further about the mechanism and how it still exists as a structural obstacle. For instance, the burden of waiting in line at voter polls for several hours. A study of Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies shows that communities of color face significantly longer waiting times at voter polls in the US, at least in certain states, 
uh, states, this image is um, taken in Florida. This burden is like an immobilizing obstacle for people struggling to make time to participate in democracy. This is just one example of unnecessarily heavy bureaucratic burdens different minorities community have to face. These thoughts about weight as a metaphor led me to make a new video piece that is currently on view as part of my solo exhibition at MoMA PS1 in New York. It is a very new piece, um, actually the latest I have finished up to date and therefore I don't have um, articulated a coherent train of thought about it just yet. I would still like to share it with you. It's um, a very short loop of only 47 seconds and I'm going to um, show it to you so that you can see at least two repetitions. And as the final piece in this lecture, I would like to jump back quite drastically um, five years back to 2013 to discuss my last piece that I made here in Berlin before moving to New York. Um, I made the piece for a group exhibition titled Erogenous Zone um, that was shown at Galerie am Körner Park and curated by the feminist collaborative FF that I then became part of afterwards. This piece is the first one where I used my own body and the video is titled Shake, in parentheses, a choreography for flying hair. It's a short loop of only eight seconds, so I'm going to speak while it's playing. I consider the piece relevant to this lecture as it marks a departure of my interest in a few aspects that I then developed further, um, like absence, in this case of the flying hair, the interest in the use of silhouettes, and the interest in giving limited information about identity. And now we're already at the last part of my lecture where I would just very briefly like to talk about um, my trajectory, my Werdegang, um, moving from Germany to the United States. Um, as Nana mentioned earlier, I graduated at the Academy of Fine Arts, the HFPK in Hamburg in 2012 and um, moved to Berlin 
right after. And at that time, I was mostly engaged in collaborative feminist work. Um, I was working a day job and not making much art. I was lucky enough to um, be introduced to a black feminist discourse here in Berlin through one friend. Her name is Melodila van Bettencourt. And um, I traveled to New York the first time in 2008 um, and always found ways and reasons to go back there. And um, in retrospect, I can say that I found it difficult to um, engage in discourses of social relevance in Hamburg, at least personally for me, I don't want to speak for everyone, um, given that, for instance, a word like Frauenkunst, women's art, was thrown around quite loosely without further consequences, just to give you an indication of the state of the arts at that time, of the feminist discourse, um, and the question of race simply, during my time at least, did not exist. Um, so when I moved to the United States, to New York, um, I was struck how organically I was able to contextualize my work and tie it to discourses of belonging and psychoanalysis and black feminist thought. And um, it really feels like coming full circle now being back after five years and for the first time speaking about my work and showing my work at the upcoming Berlin Biennial. And I'm very curious to see how my work will be perceived and spoken about here. And I think this is a good moment to open up the conversation and see what audience members might have to share. Is this? Yeah, super. Okay, danke schön, Martin. Um, okay, um, I have one question, which is basically, if you can talk a little bit more about the negative space and the kind of anonymous body, which is a body that is in our imaginary, and your choice to actually not show the actual body. I think there is like something to that that is very important to your practice and speaks very much also to what we discussed yesterday in the sense of refusal and the you know like how how are we dealing with um, with black bodies and representation mm -hmm. um, I think what motivated me oh this is okay I think what motivated me to work with negative space and air in my sculptures is that viewers tend to be engaged in a really particular way. They actually finish the work in their mind. Um, I think there are identifiable cues to the sculptures um, that give enough information of what could be implied. Oh, this is very loud now. Um, and I, as the artist, don't want to end the sentence and say which body I had or have in mind for this kind of interactions. I like it when um, viewers can project whatever informs their projection into these Hohlräume or um, negative spaces. I saw another hand over there earlier. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you just show the black and white slides, or is um, there no color in your work? So the two videos that I showed uh, were both shot in black and white, but the sculptures are um, of subtle color. So did it read as black and white to you? M mostly, yes. Uh-huh. I don't, um, it's part of the projection, perhaps. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. how, how about other audience members? Did, did it seem black and white? No. Okay. 
some yellow. I could see the blue glaze, mm -hmm. the blue glazes, and then the belt has lots of yellow. Yeah. With the bananas. Yeah. yeah. The, the use of my, my color range is really quite subtle, and I actually realized it during install of my solo show at PS1, how um, I think how the gray sky of Hamburg informs my, my palette. <laughs> So, <laughs> with, with the gray sky as a backdrop, um, colors really pop out, and I think that has something to do with the subtle use of color. Here we are. Thank you very much. Uh, can you talk more about how you can, or the use of ceramics? Can you talk how you got to it, and what does it represent to you right now? Mm -hmm. Um, I think I got to it just by being attracted to the material and it has qualities that I also associate with drawing in the sense that ceramics is really intuitive. You just take a piece of clay out of the bag and you can um, model it right away. It's very malleable. Um, but conceptually, while already making these tools, I slowly understood that um, it really works in my favor in the sense that I'm not interested in designing torturous uh, elements or actual functional elements. I'm interested in um, making sculptures that are kind of a mind game, a uh, Gedankenspiel. And because ceramics is so fragile in its nature, it, it negates the actual use and therefore it works in my favor. Thank you. Um, this is just a small question right after the color. Um, so, okay, you, you talked about the gray Hamburg skies and uh, we're in Kiel all the time, we're even grayer. Um, <laughs> uh, and also this blue, I, I was wondering why you chose blue for the insides mm -hmm. of, of that imaginary body. Um, the blue means a lot to me from the north. There's that Prussian blue, there's like Sax Blau, and it's the color I use in my work. What was the first blue you mentioned? Prussian blue. Persian blue, yeah. Prussian Pru Pru Blau. Blau. Prussian. Um, yeah, I think first of all there is a surreal aspect to the blue. So um, I often use really glossy glaze in the inside of the casts and matte glaze on the outside referencing skin. So if you think about it more realistically, the glossy inside could be something like blood which we associate with being red. Um, so there's a surreal aspect, um, but also blue, especially in the black American context, I associate with blues and depression and um, different capacities of the human psyche. Um, so that's another signifier. Um, and then there are just unconscious choices where I, I just feel drawn <laughs> to the color. I like blue. Mm. Um, I would like to know um, something about your relationship to Marcel Duchamp. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a bit weird, that question, but um, looking at your work, I, I couldn't help thinking about uh, the Coin de Chasse City. Uh, it's like a piece of sculpture meant to be worn by his wife, blocking her uh, genital organ, uh, or étant donné with a mutilated body of a woman um, in a sort of like um, gaze regime. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered what, if there's any relationship, or if I'm just making that up in my mind, or um, yeah, what uh, happens if you, um, as a, you know, from a feminist um, and, um, uh, post-colonial context, um, take that position of authorship, showing things uh, that you do with your body, whereas he did these things, like these forms of female bodies using 
female models, obviously, as a male artist? I mean, mm. maybe, is there yeah, something in my thought? Yeah, I think there are thought? two separate questions. I, I, I don't have a relationship, a direct one, to Duchamp. He doesn't exist in my bookshelf, at least not so far. Um, and then the second question um, is actually very interesting because I do use my own body as the metrics for the work and at the same time in the chastity um, belt part that I showed, protector two, there is this element of a flap um, that stands in for a potential erection of s something phallic um, that I as a cis female don't have. So um, again, it's, I'm, I'm also appropriating notions of the cis male gender. That, that's what comes to mind. Hmm. I think um, to connect what, to what you just said, I'm interested in uh, I would like I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the ways you um, would say your work reflects on gender issues because um, the chastity belt work for example I found very interesting and also the one the tuner um, because it was interesting to me in the selection that you showed that the works that were more like feminine, had more feminine connotations, were about like being invaded or being um, penetrated. And these works that are, for me personally, that seemed much more masculine, were concerned with restrictions. But maybe mm. that's just because of the selection, so. Mm. No, I think it's a very accurate observation. I have to think about it. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier the aspect of biological determination, which I think is like a whole discourse of its own. Um, and on one hand, it's useful to think about it. On, on the other hand, it can be quite limiting. That being said, um, it does open a whole range of um, binaries of active and passive and dominant and submissive and um, intruding and penetrated. And um, I think within that dynamic, uh, it makes sense to place restriction on the active part. That, that would be my initial response. Um, what I, I really enjoyed that question because what I, what I always love about your work is that there is not, you know, like the, like the language that you just use, like, okay, there's an active and there's an active part, but there's also a passive part. And the pieces themselves, to me, don't really allow me to really determine. It's like actually not necessary, like to, to gender this anonymous body. Like why? It's also part to me of the of the game that Julia is playing with us, right? So what is this tuna? What like there is a performativity of the voice that is then coded in the binary gender system, but there is actually a possibility to also tune your voice. There's um, you know, in transitioning, there are moments of um, there are entire like. Um, um, how is it called again? The the person who is working with you on your um, voice, voice training. voice training, and there's a specific word for that in German. There's voice training, and and it, these are all elements that this anonymous body can enact, may enact, may not enact. To me, you know, something phallic. I mean, it can. It does not necessarily have to be a fleshy penis. You know, it, it can be something different, and and to me that is where the um, where this this like space opened up in between in 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 the negative spaces. 
That's my reading. <laughs> I saw a hand. On. I give you. Yes. Um, I. Uh, so doing this conference here in Berlin, you are coming back after five years. Nana, the same, she is establishing uh, her center of work and life in, in New York. Um, the, the last part of your um, uh, lecture, uh, so the German-American um, relationship, it's, um, it's interests me a lot uh, in terms of um, what 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 happened? Just to understand that, you know, um, I probably it's a it's a big topic uh, uh, to to reflect on. I understand very well um, the differences, uh, but the creativity, the the developing of your work happened in Germany, uh, a huge part. Um, so it's a German experience. Uh, it's an experience you 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 are you. This 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 creativity uh, is. Uh, what makes you think that it developed in Germany? No, I, uh, the, the very early work from... Um, Shake, uh, the Shake, video. for example. Mm -hmm. You are very near to, um, to a lot of questions which uh, are coming up in the, yes. in the sculptural work later. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I understand completely that you are uh, arriving in, in, another, in another context. And the question I have, this is also the reason uh, why, why we fight for, for a conference like this here in Berlin, at this place in the center. Um, but also you can see, you know, we have 400 members of the academy, uh, artists, uh, all ages, no one is here, you know. So uh, just to, to make very clear uh, where we are, it's a criticism we have to, to, uh, to do also in every institution. Um, but um, I'm thinking about the future, you know. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe very strongly that Berlin or the uh, uh, areas in, in Germany can become a similar uh, energetic place to, to transform society and to, to, to bring up these questions and to create a, a field in which, in which you can do that in a, in a context uh, where you feel uh, socialized or uh, where you feel... Uh, 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 with, a, with a response, um, but uh, five years ago it wasn't there. Is it, is it really? I, I, I'm very interested in this um, in, in this uh, uh, decision to go to the United States and and to develop your thought there. Um, coming back now to Germany. Um, uh, what, what do we have to do, you know? What are our homeworks, in fact? Something like that, to, to change that. This is, this is uh, my, my big question as a, for, for this institution, you know? Mm. It's probably, I, we can just keep it like I that. I think it's probably yeah. a question for the room. Mm. I mean, I, I cannot speak for Julia, but I think what is quite interesting is that there is so often, like it's almost like an exiling not yeah. I'm not speaking mm. for you but you know when you think about um, people like uh, James Baldwin Eartha Kid James Baldwin's uh, refuge was Istanbul Eartha Kid was also in Istanbul then there is Paris then there is uh, on the other side from here you go to New York you are going to London there is no space here and strangely so um, so often you have to establish yourself somewhere else where you're able to um, do the work that you want to do um, and then all of a sudden you find recognition where you are from. And I think that is actually a pattern that you can see in so many um, artists who, you know, like have to travel um, across the Atlantic in both directions actually mm -hmm. because um, someone like you know, for instance, uh, an example from the 19th century of um, an African-American painter called Henry Osava Tena um, had to, was fa found no possibility to um, study uh, painting in the U.S. Nobody would uh, allow him to become part of an, um, there was no program, you know, but to study with uh, an apprenti apprentice. 
ship. Um, so he moved to, to Paris where he found great recognition. He was exhibited in the Salon alongside, you know, what we call today like the French canon. And then he returned and then he found recognition. So these kind of moves happen incredibly often um, and not necessarily, uh, are not very often discussed. Thank you very much for sharing your work. I would like to jump back to Nana's reading of um, you creating a, a space of in-betweenness between the active and the passive. And um, in the end of your talk, you mentioned your interest in psychoanalysis. And then in the very beginning, you were um, using this um, term doer and done to, which is um, for me referring to Jessica Benjamin's title of her latest book, Beyond the Doer in the Dantu. So mm -hmm. my question, was this by chance or um, would you like to talk a bit about <laughs> I, this psychoanalytic I came across interest? that uh, title actually after I had first used doer, Dantu in an artist statement. So it was by chance, but also not because both um, was came, came out of uh, an interest in psychoanalytic thought. Um, yeah, I think the, the sculptures give me a possibility of addressing a space in between because it's also frustrating to only think about doer and done to its, its limiting. Um, very often, I think, in psychological processes when um, trauma is being digested, there is the stage of victimhood and then moving past it, reclaiming. It's, I think there, there is an urge to be beyond or outside um, the binary or adding another dimension. And that to me is the air in, in my work. Okay, if we don't have, and do, do you have one more question? Okay. Hi, thank you so much. What I really appreciate about your work is that you were, and your sharing of it was that you were very um, forthcoming in terms of the, the, the historic and symbolic registers that inform your aesthetic. So for me, regardless of whether there's a black body visible, right? Because, and here I'm thinking about the way um, uh, black feminist Horton Spillers conceptualizes the black body is always within language, so it's always captured. And, and she thinks more about this concept of the enfleshed. So I think because the, um, the sensibility and the aesthetics and the history that you're drawing from actually articulates a type of uh, black history or, or a black aesthetic, um, that we actually don't need the black body there to assert. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so we are going to close the keynote. Thank you so, so much, Julia. Whilst listening to Julia, I became so aware that we have like literally almost from every um, type of art, someone present here. I'm so grateful um, to have a sculpture. We are going to go into the um, next work so workshop sessions. Sorry, you feel uncomfortable. We'll um, welcome those of you who have registered. If you haven't, please do. Um, upstairs, but we are not so many. I think it's manageable. Um, and uh, Joshua Quish C. Akins is going to give the virtual Berlin tour for those of you who haven't had a chance yesterday. The virtual, not like just the tour, the um, post-colonial um, tour. And then we have, um, that is all on the fourth floor. And, um, and then we are going to welcome Anta Helena Recke and Julia Wissert, two amazing theater persons um, here on stage for a dialogue. See you soon. <laughs>